information. Um, so uh, as I've said before, so I'm a final year medical student and I'd love to uh, share with you our uh, most recent uh, results and updates from uh, the SNAP2 uh, project, uh, which uh, we've done uh, as part of uh, a combined supervision between uh, Romani, uh, Steve Harris and uh, Danny Wong. And um, so first of all, uh, I guess we all may agree that without an absolute indication for critical care, such as uh, organ support or organ replacement therapy, there appears to be a gray zone of surgical patients where uh, it remains unclear who may benefit from post-operative ICU admission and who may not. So I would love to uh, start off with a figure from uh, Danny and Romani on the left-hand side. And um, uh, you can see that there, uh, so this is uh, basically data from the, the SNAP2 uh, study uh, published recently in uh, the BJA. And you can see that there is a correlation between the total number of hospital beds and the total number of critical care beds. And uh, you can also see that the utilization of critical care beds is uh, correlated with uh, the total critical care bed availability. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see um, a study by Hannah Wunsch from Canada, uh, who has probably uh, dedicated uh, many years of research uh, in this field as well. And uh, similar to the cardiac output in the heart, uh, she postulated a Starling curve to conceptualize the balance between ICU benefits and ICU harms. So she actually questioned whether the addition of more ICU beds always means that more lives will be saved or whether there is a deflection point at which no additional mortality benefit is gained in the ICU. So in alignment with uh, the studies by Hannah Wunsch, uh, we have done a study in Boston uh, a couple of years ago, which was published uh, last year in a a So we propensity matched 3,500 ICU admitted patients after surgery uh, to uh, 3,500 patients who were admitted to the wards after the surgery. And indeed, we were able to show that there appears to be a deflection point as Hannah Wunsch has proposed. So here you can see our results. Now let me move this to the other side. Can you also see my cursor? Yeah, okay. So uh, here you can see our results. So we analyzed the hospital length of stay in red and um, hospital costs in green. And we basically did a propensity match. So we compared ICU admitted patients to ward admitted patients. And we, uh, we did a stratification based on the acuity level of the patient. So first total is low acuity, third total is high acuity. So very critical ill patients in the third total. And you can see in the, in the third total, um, so very critical ill patients, if they are admitted to the ICU, they have lower lengths of stay, so shorter lengths of stay and shorter costs compared to water admitted patients after surgery. And in contrast, if you look uh, into the first total, so patients with a low acuity, uh, less critical ill patients, uh, if these patients are going to the ICU after surgery, uh, you can see they have higher costs and they uh, are staying in the hospital longer. So there, there appears to be uh, a deflection point uh, where the negative consequences of ICU admission uh, seems to outweigh the positive ones, as Hannah Wunsch has uh, postulated. So the problem um, is that in terms of mortality as an outcome, there is equipoise in the medical literature over which patient may benefit from critical care after surgery. So uh, I guess we are all aware of the study by Brennan Kahan and the ISIS group in London, which was published in 2017. Uh, they included roughly uh, 44,000 patients from more than 450 hospitals in uh, 27 countries. And they showed that ICU admission after surgery appears to be harmful with regards to uh, survival. So again, they compared uh, wards admitted patients uh, to uh, ICU admitted patients, and here you can see the odds ratio of uh, 3.01 um, for uh, uh, mortality risk uh, after uh, being admitted to the ICU. Uh, interestingly, um, if you look into the methods, and I guess this would be uh, the key point of the whole presentation, they used logistic regression model. 
So uh, I will go into uh, more detail uh, on the next slides. Uh, however, so if you use uh, these kind of, let's say, traditional uh, models or traditional analyses, uh, you are limited to uh, a, a set of the uh, confounders. So um, basically, uh, you may argue that uh, they have not uh, conf adjusted for un unobserved confounders uh, in their model. And um, other limitations may be that uh, they did not account for ICU occupancy data. So as you can see from our first uh, slide, so if you look into uh, Ramani's or Danny's uh, publication, so uh, data on ICU beds, pre-ICU beds uh, is important, I guess, uh, for these kind of analyses. And uh, another point would be that they um, also included un unplanned ICU admission after surgery. So for example, if there is an uh, emergency case in, in the OR, the patient has a uh, hemorrhage or a hypotension, uh, they will be admitted to the ICU uh, uh, as an, as an un un unplanned procedure. And uh, I guess uh, we have to differentiate if, if the as admissions we are looking at are planned or unplanned. Um, so on the other hand, if you look into the literature, uh, there is a recent publication by Steve Harris and colleagues from 2019. Um, he also looked at the at mortality uh, between ICU admitted patients and uh, rules admitted patients. And um, he basically uh, repeated the same kind of analysis. So he, he used regression model and he was able to reproduce the results from uh, the ISOS group. So uh, Steve and colleagues showed that uh, if you are admitted to the ICU, you have a 7.4% higher risk uh, of 28-day uh, mortality than wards admitted patients. Um, however, the key point in this paper is they um, also included other type of uh, analyses. So they also used a so-called IV method. So IV stands for instrumental variable method. And um, the, the strength of this method is that um, you're able to adjust for observed confounders as you would do with the regression model. Um, However, you also adjust for unmeasured or um, hidden or unobserved confounders. And interestingly, if they used this IV method, um, they were able to show that there is no um, uh, harm or no uh, mortality uh, or no harm basically if you are going to the ICU. So uh, there was no significant difference between the uh, wards admitted uh, cord and the ICU admitted cord. Uh, in in contrast, uh, they also did subcord analyses. So they actually showed um, that certain patients are actually benefiting from ICU. For example, if they have a very uh, severely impaired uh, physiological status, you can see that uh, there appears to be a benefit if they are going to uh, the ICU. They also showed that, for example, older patients uh, are benefiting uh, from uh, ICU admission after surgery. So uh, all in all, there seems to be uh, an equipoise in the literature. So uh, one study using logistic regression showing that ICU admission is harmful. And another study by Steve Harris shows that uh, there appears to be a survival benefit if you're going to the ICU. So this unclear uh, literature uh, was basically the, the rationale uh, for the SNAP2 uh, project. So uh, we have conducted a, a pre-specified study uh, to examine the causal effect of critical care versus surgical wards admission, which is our treatment group on the following outcomes, which is first of all, seven day morbidity, 30 day mortality and 60 day mortality. And um, the seven day morbidity is uh, encoded by the POMS score. POMS uh, stands for post-operative morbidity survey. Uh, so I will uh, show you the, uh, the exact score uh, on the uh, following slides. Um, in terms of um, analyses, uh, we first of all, um, similar to the ISOS group by Kahn et al., we first of all did multivariable regression. So we adjusted for 29 observed confounders. Um, and then as a second step, as a secondary analysis, we have used this instrumental uh, variable methods um, to uh, account for observed and unobserved confounders. So uh, I've included uh, a slide on the instrumental variable method uh, just to give you an overview. So first of all, 
uh, here you can see we have an endogenous variable, which is basically our treatment group variable. So we have ICU admission versus uh, ward admission after surgery. And it is important to note that uh, the endogenous variable is influenced um, by other observed and un unobserved confounders in this whole model. Secondly, we have this dependent variable, which is basically our outcome. So we have seven day mobility, 30 day and 60 day uh, mortality. And then now as a third step, we are introducing our instrument into this model. So in our case, we are uh, using the number of empty beds and the number of discharge ready patients as an instrument to account for ICU bed occupancy at the time of surgery. And um, uh, it is important. Uh, so there are certain requirements for this instrument. So first of all, this instrument um, must correlate with this endogenous variable. So uh, if there is a strong correlation between these two variables, uh, we can say that the instrument is very strong. Uh, another requirement is that um, the instrument is um, uh, also associated with uh, the outcome uh, only through its direct association with the endogenous variable. So there's no direct link between the instrument and the dependent variable. So the instrument's only uh, affecting or influencing the dependent variable through the endogenous variable. And this is called uh, exclusion restriction criterion. And uh, another uh, requirement is that uh, the instrument is not affected by uh, any other variables. So these other confounders only affect the endogenous variables, but the instrument is uh, so-called exogenous. It's not influenced by anything else. So with uh, these requirements given, um, the instrumental uh, variable uh, identifies or uh, isolates uh, the average direct effect of the treatment on the outcomes, independent of the unobserved confounders. So this is why we can actually make causal inferences in observational studies uh, because of all these uh, requirements of the instrument. So uh, unlike the multivariate regression where you can show that there is an association, uh, we are able to, uh, to make uh, basically statements on uh, causal effects in, in these kind of models. So here you can see a slide on our primary outcome, the POM score, post-operative mobility survey. This is a score uh, which basically covers uh, all major uh, organ uh, systems uh, from the brain, for example, if you have uh, delirium or confusion, uh, to the pulmonary system, uh, if you require oxygen or uh, a respiratory support, if you have an infection, for example, uh, encoded by fever, uh, any kind of renal pathologies, uh, GI pathologies such as nausea or vomiting, uh, also if you have a pain and they require opioids, uh, this will be uh, included in, in the POM score. So to summarize, uh, we conducted a, a prospective international uh, cohort study in uh, 248 hospitals across uh, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand in the year 2017. Uh, in total, we included uh, 21,935 adult surgical patients uh, who underwent inpatient surgery without an absolute indication for postoperative ICU. So for example, an absolute indication for post-op ICU would be cardiac surgery, uh, cardiac uh, heart transplant or uh, liver transplant, a triple A repair, for example. And then analysis wise, as I've said before, so first of all, we did the multivariate regression where we only adjust for observed confounders. And then as a second step, similar to Steve Harris, we did the IV method where we account for observed and unobserved confounders. So here you can see our study flow chart. Uh, and again, here you can see all our exclusion criteria. Uh, so we exclude, we only included the first surgery of each patient. So if a patient had multiple surgeries during the same stay, we only included the first stay. Um, also, all patients who were in a an, uh, high acuity ward prior to the surgery, for example, if they were in an, in an ICU prior to the surgery, they were excluded as we would assume they will go back to the ICU after the surgery. Uh, also, we excluded all patients with absolute ICU indication, as I said before, liver transplant, uh, AAA procedures, uh, and so on. Also, all patients uh, who have been in the hospital for more than seven days were excluded. So uh, you could assume that patients um, who are longer in the hospital would accumulate uh, certain diseases, 
uh, which will certainly have an effect on our primary outcome, which is the POM score. So we excluded all patients who are longer in the hospital than seven days. Also, we looked at each different site, um, hospital site, and looked at the quality of their reporting. And if they had uh, more than 20% missing data, they were excluded. And in contrast to the study by Kahan and colleagues, uh, we also excluded all patients who had unplanned ICU admission. So unplanned means if they had, for example, hemorrhage in the OR or uh, hypertension. So we ended up with our final cohort of roughly 22,000 patients. Here you can see an overview of our confounders. So we used um, basic demographic uh, variables such as age and sex, uh, different comorbidities of the patient covering uh, uh, the cardiovascular system such as CAD or CHF, uh, the pulmonary system, COPD, dyspnea, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, hepatic system, renal system, and the metabolic system. We also included variables uh, on the preoperative um, characteristics of the patients, for example, the ASA score of the patient, the GCS score prior to surgery, uh, physiological parameters such as a systolic blood pressure or heart rate, uh, where is the patient actually coming from? Is he coming from uh, home or is he already in the hospital prior to the surgery? And finally, we have also uh, accounted for intraoperative variables, for example, the grade of the anesthetist or the surgeon who's involved in the surgery. So uh, is, it, is it a consultant or is it a registrar? Uh, was the surgery done at night? Is it a general surgery? And how complex or how severe is the whole surgical procedure? Here you can see our results, our primary outcomes. Again, our seven-day morbidity, 30-day mortality, and 60-day mortality. And the results are presented as risk ratios and 95% confidence interval, and again, we are comparing ICU admitted patients to ward admitted patients after surgery. And uh, each outcome is stratified by the analysis method we use, so you can see multivalent regression and IV method for each outcome. So if we only focus on multivariate regression, we are able to reproduce the results from the ISOS group. So overall outcomes or across all outcomes, ICU admitted patients have um, a higher risk for seven day morbidity, higher risk for uh, 30 day mortality, and a higher risk for 60 day mortality compared to ward admitted patients. So, this is nothing new given the publication from the ISIS group. Um, now, if we do the instrumental variable method where we account for observed and unobserved confounders, again, the ICU admitted patients have a higher risk for seven day morbidity. And interestingly, if you look at mortality at 30 days and 60 days, you can see that um, ICU admitted patients have a 9% and 10% lower risk of 30 day and 60 day mortality risk. So we are uh, now moving towards the, the results or the trend of the results from Steve Harris uh, with the instrumental variable method that ICU admission appears to be beneficial. After that, we have done um, multiple subgroup analyses. Uh, here you can see one of these. Uh, so uh, we've done one uh, subgroup analysis on uh, stratified by the surgical risk of the patient. And uh, you can stratify the surgical risk by uh, the surgical outcome risk tool, which is also known as the SORT score. And interestingly, you can see, so the higher the SORT score is, uh, the higher the risk of the surgical risk of the patient. And interestingly, there seems to be an incremental increase of survival benefit uh, with the increase of the surgical risk of the patient. So let's take, for example, uh, patients who have um, a SORT score of greater than 9%. Uh, they have a 35% um, mortality benefit or survival benefit compared to a ward admitted patients. So all in all, we can say that uh, admission to the ICU after surgery is a double-edged sword. So uh, with regards to postoperative morbidity, uh, you can clearly see that uh, postoperative ICU admission increases the risk of seven-day morbidity. This may be due to invasive monitoring in the ICU, uh, immobilization in the ICU, or for example, due to ICU-acquired uh, delirium. However, if you uh, focus on long-term outcomes, such as uh, mortality at day 30 and day uh, 60, you can see that there appears to be a mortality benefit for ICU patients. And the reason for that may be that there is a close patient monitoring 
So there's one to one or one to two uh, nurse to patient uh, ratio uh, in the ICU. Uh, you have advanced care, you have advanced monitoring, um, you may be able to uh, use uh, advanced type of therapies and drugs, um, so which may improve uh, the mortality of the patient. So it's basically a discussion of um, investment and return of investment. So the investment would be that the patient have a higher risk of mobility at day seven. However, the return of this investment would be that they uh, have a survival benefit uh, on a long-term scale. So these were the analyses that we have done so far. So we've done multivariate regression and instrumental variable method. And now um, recently we are focusing on um, near-far matching. So near-far matching is uh, another method um, to basically account for matching. So similar to propensity matching, we're trying to balance the cone founders we're using. However, uh, we still would love to use or uh, uh, take advantage of um, the uh, causal inference analysis. So we would love to take advantage of the, of the instrumental variable method. And this near file matching would allow us to uh, basically uh, use both of these uh, advantages. So we can match the patients and still make um, causal inferences because we are uh, adjusting for unobserved confounders with this method. And the goal of this method or basically is to strengthen our instrument. Um, so uh, basically uh, what this near file matching does is it's, it's a filter. So um, uh, it's basically filtering the study cohort to match patients to be near on all the observed confounders and to be far on the instruments. So uh, in the end, we will have patients who have similar confounders, uh, but uh, different uh, instruments. And um, so far we've done uh, one analysis. So we matched uh, 432 patients who were admitted to the ICU to 432 patients who were admitted to the ward. And um, based on this near file matching, uh, we were able to confirm the results. Uh, they're turning out to be more significant than before. So again, we can say that ICU admitted patients have a 9% uh, lower mortality risk than water admitted patients with regards to 30 day mortality. Uh, however, the problem uh, we are running into right now is that um, near file matching requires um, much computational power, so we need uh, working memory. So uh, it's an effort uh, between <laughs> multiple people so far. So Danny tried it on his computer, I tried it on mine, Steve uh, recently tried it on his. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to run this uh, matching procedure uh, for the whole study cohort. So we decided to uh, run this on uh, an external cloud server. So we use uh, Microsoft uh, servers for that. Uh, unfortunately, this did not work out, and um, I guess last week uh, Ed Palmer offered his uh, computer um, via um, remote control to to run this analysis. So uh, our hope would be that hope would be that we could basically um, strengthen the instrument by using this new file matching, uh, which so far is limited by uh, technical difficulties, unfortunately. Yeah, um, also as an update, um, so the, these results were also present, uh, presented at the APPOM uh, conference uh, during the summer, and there will be uh, a presentation uh, on this Saturday for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. If you have time and interest, uh, feel free to join. So uh, I'm happy to take your questions and suggestions or possible solutions uh, for the near-far matching. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.